Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We take from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the authors. We know you want actions, not theories, and it's actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about, helping you to become a wicked company. Marcus, I had no idea that you were actually a food scientist and that you'd man- managed to take alcohol and turn it into an edible goblet. When did you learn this? Well, Troy, it was not quite turning water into wine, I must say. But yeah, um, I, I've been a mad professor for a while, I guess. And so uh, working with not just software and hardware, but chemicals and cooking wasn't that far a stretch, really. So the whole El Bulli thing, yeah, we, we, we did that on and on. Okay, and, and for, for, for the rest of you who are listening yeah. to this little kind of scientific or mad scientist discussion, yes, the book that we're going to be talking about today tells amazing stories about teams and innovation and leadership, but in the context of high-end food science. Marcus, tell us about the guest. So we were talking to Vaughn Tan, who wrote the book, The Uncertainty Mindset, and he writes about uh, restaurants like El Bulli and um, the Fat Duck and all who were going into the very deep end of innovation in the culinary industry. And it was an amazing conversation, A, because I nearly fanboyed out, but uh, also because it's really interesting how these teams, how these restaurants keep reinventing how we experience food from year to year every year is different you know it's it's, it's utterly amazing what they do and how they how they so the, the question really is then so how they how do they build teams how do they get their talent in how do they live with uncertainty how do they live with constant innovation and the, the challenge that takes and what can organizations learn from it so we did a lot on did a lot of talking on that less about food actually but it's it's an amazing strong story because I love that stuff and think everyone likes food. So it's a brilliant book to look at under that circumstance. Uh, And it's definitely less dry than your average managerial book or innovation book for sure. But what were your takeaways, Troy? I mean, there was so much great stuff in this particular conversation. It's hard to narrow it down to two. Um, The one phrase was productively uncomfortable. You know, how do you become so productively uncomfortable on a regular basis that it triggers learning or triggers education? And I think that's a, it's a really great concept that not everything is going to be easy. It's not always going to be perfect, but it shouldn't be so extremely uncomfortable that it's discouraging. It should be productively uncomfortable. And the second one is is one of the, the bigger themes that I talk about quite a lot, whether it's in work context or whether it's even in my personal and my social life, is this concept of trust and how trust plays a very important role when it comes to your ability to handle uncertainty. So you can't have the entire world be uncertain. You need some things that are anchors. You need to trust something about your coworkers. You need to trust something about your leadership. And if you have those things in place, then you can relax a little and be more comfortable with uncertainty. And I think it's a really, really important bit. But uh, enough about my rambling. So what did you take away? Yeah, so obviously for me, this was, besides the food part, um, you know, this is this is really when you look at wicked problems, which I love talking about, is wicked. Pro- one of the main characteristics in wicked problems is that is that uncertainty level. So uh, with wicker problems, you will always have a certain level of uncertainty. It, ne- it will never go away. Tame problems, you know, mass production, most engineering challenges, um, you can get quite comfortable with and you can control them and whatnot. Wicked problems, never get there. So you better get comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, it's one thing, but I think we had three or four other parts that keep coming up. And I think this book in particular, this conversation in particular had four or five standard references that we pull all the way and it's all in one conversation which i was very happy about you know things about 
um, you know, how do you create leadership that enables and builds trust and makes you okay with failure and treating failure as value? How do you hire people like that? Um, you know, how do you hire not based on a set of skills, which when you do innovation will never be enough. There will always be new skills to learn. So therefore, a list of skills when you hire makes no sense to hire like that. You know, so he talked about a different way of hiring people based on sort of negotiating what needs to be done and what outcome needs to be achieved and how flexible people are. And he talks about, I think to some extent about resilience, but also how flexible or like a willow organizations can be if they hire differently. As much as appreciating that there will be people that will be quite flexible and more comfortable with change and others that aren't. And where do you place these people and how do you hire some people for this and other people for that? So it's a really, really, really um, detailed conversation about all these areas. So I'm not going to go into specifics. I'm rather going to let people listen to the interview. But um, I found this one of the most dense and richest um, conversations we had that I think, in particular towards wicked problems, addressed most of the important factors that it needs to be a wicked company. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think he's talking a lot about wicked problems around the whole uncertainty and the fact that the problem is changing while you're solving it without ever actually kind of focusing in specifically around wicked problems. But in any case, he did disclose to us his secret hideaway, his lair from which he's doing all of his work during this crazy COVID-19 times. But we're not going to disclose it to you, our listeners, or to anybody else in the university. And instead, Marcus, what do you say we go to right to the interview? Let's do that. So hello, everyone. Today, we're here with Vaughn Tan. Uh, hello, Vaughn, and thank you for making time for us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Very interesting book. We got very excited here, and I'm trying to hold back my fanboy attitude towards uh, food in general and restaurants of like El Bulli in particular. So let's then rather start and with tell us a little bit about who you are and why you wrote this book in particular, please. Absolutely. So I'm a strategy professor, consultant, author, I guess. Uh, I teach at University College London School of Management. And I basically wrote the book because I realized over the last five or six years that people definitely don't understand the difference between risk and true uncertainty. And so I think this also means that they generally don't understand how uncertainty can drive. And in fact, maybe is the only true driver for real adaptation and real innovation. So I kind of wanted to write a book like this to not only share some interesting stories about restaurants, because I think they're very interesting, but also to show that there is a way in which being uncertain and embracing uncertainty is not just something you have to do, but it's actually something that's good for you, good for teams, good for organizations, and especially good for innovation. Yeah, lovely. Um, I think that's a very important aspect of, I think, any kind of modern modern organization. And I think there's... Um, through reference of some of the other talks we had about learning uh, and few we had about design and creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we here and there discussed the idea of how to become an expert and the 10,000 hours rule that sort of has been a bit debunked or whatever and deliberate practice, which goes back to, you know, um, new learn learnings about the science of how learning and the brain works. And many, many organizations really struggle to recruit and retain the right kind of experts or creative heads or problem solvers. Let, let alone a whole t uh, whole team of them. Mm -hmm. How would you how would you say, and if you can give some examples on, you know, how today's teams couldn't work in reference to to some of the research you've been doing? Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good question. So, as you point out, that ten thousand hours of deliberate practice research is, I mean, saying it's been debunked is well, it's, it's strong. I. I don't necessarily think it applies to this kind of question, especially expertise in the context of innovation. Um, the original research, which I think was from the early 90s, was about people learning how to play a musical instrument. So it was about expertise where I guess the definition of the skill that needs to be developed is quite circumscribed. There's no kind of uncertainty about it. There's no emergence about knowing how to manipulate an instrument like a violin. There is uncertainty about what you produce with that instrument but not about the, the physical embodied skill of, of using the violin. Um, and I think for that kind of expertise, 
definitely, if you invest a lot of time, you learn the affordances of the tool and of the material, and you become very good at doing what you're doing in that context. Now, the question that you're posing is, you know, you, we've got these teams of experts uh, that are innovation teams. And your question, I guess, is how do you build teams that have the expertise of innovation? I would argue that this is a very different kind of expertise from the perspective of like, from the perspective of how to build a team that can be expert at coming up with new ideas, especially ones that have never been had before. I would argue that the way you build it is not to go out and find necessarily a bunch of people who are very good at one thing. Here's another person who's very good at another thing, even though that is important. The most important thing is figuring out how you bring all these people who are good at what they do together with each other in a way that allows every person who is a part of the team to understand what the other people bring to the team and how they can work together. So that process of team integration and exploring what individual members of the team are good at and what they want to do, that's really, really hard. And I would say, you know, if I take examples from uh, the culinary R&D teams that I worked with, one way that managers and leaders can do this is simply by changing the way they bring people into these teams in the first place. So one of the things that conventional HR practice does when you're trying to hire into a new team is you define the job scope, you write a very detailed job description, and then you go out and you try and find people who match that job description. And when you do the interviews and do the other evaluations to figure out who you're actually going to hire, you try and pick people who match that job description the best. Uh, I don't think this works for innovation because the definition of innovation is that you have no idea what you're trying to do. You just know that it has to be new and you have to figure out as you're doing it whether this new thing is actually good. In a situation like that, a clear and stable job description makes absolutely no sense. How will you know in advance what people need to do if you don't know what it is that they need to produce? So if you are a leader and you're trying to build an innovation team, instead of going through the conventional human resources process of like, you know, putting out a job description and then recruiting and then interviewing, the better thing to do might be what I call negotiated joining in the context of open-ended roles. So you might say to people uh, who might be a member of your R&D team or your innovation team, uh, come join us for a few months, during which time possibly you can even pay them a pro rata full-time salary. And during this time, uh, you know, some part of your job that we know needs to be done will be clearly specified, but a bit of your job, 10%, 20%, we don't know, uh, is something that we don't know at all. And you should help us figure that out by trying things out and showing us what you're trying out and trying to convince us that it's good for us and good for you. Uh, you know, if you want a very concrete example, this is basically what Google's 20% time is supposed to be. And historically, in some cases, 20% time does result in actually really interesting things that would not have been done if 20% time didn't exist. So it's not just in the kind of you know, high-end culinary R&D teams that this idea of a provisional role that is open-ended, that is then developed using negotiated joining exists. In fact, this idea of percentage time has been in place for many decades even. I think 3M was the first company that did something like that uh, a while ago. So yeah, so I, I think that's one way that you can uh, build a team that works in a way that is expert as a team. There will probably have to be people who have expertise inside, but they don't all need to be experts in the way that the 10,000 hours research says expertise works. So that, that was a very circuitous answer, I guess, and I hope it kind of addresses some of the questions that you had in relation to that. Yeah. Oh, it definitely does, um, and I think because it is quite a complex thing, and I would even uh, potentially expand maybe and ask a bit deeper on that because um, I've seen because you know a lot of our work is in change and transformation, so we sometimes have to teach people who have no design background yeah. um, actions and activities and artifacts and tools around design thinking, which is you know about exploring ideas and asking the right questions and basically you know, starting to think a little bit in a way certain designers think like in order to problem solve better. And problem solving is sort of a business as usual thing, or at least it should be, right? You shouldn't just not ask any questions, leave it as it is. Yeah. And then when you do that, usually you end up uh, messing things up or things just 
don't stay the same qu- the same quality, or people are unable to react by themselves. And if 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 I look at what a lot of clients are talking about or need, they say, well, our teams need to be a bit more self enabled, right? Mm-hmm. And they're not. And for me, this calls all these things back my days, you know, as as an artist and designer to go. Well, back in the days, it was only the outcome that mattered, and I just took whatever tools I needed to, and sometimes needed to find the right tools to do the things I needed to do to get the outcome. Wouldn't you say that that applies not just to to innovation teams? And if so, can you talk a bit more about this negotiating approach to saying it's not just about a list of skills, it's something else? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I... So I, I teach a course, I teach two courses actually on strategy and design thinking. And I would even expand on what you were saying about the importance of problem solving uh, to say that the best teams are not only the ones that are good at solving problems, they're the ones who are good at defining and finding the right problems to solve, right? So you know this idea that uh, you can have a very good solution to a problem, but if the problem is not the right problem to solve, even the very good solution is not the correct solution. Um, I would say that this, the, the general idea behind negotiated joining is that instead of saying to an employee, here is a role that we expect you to perform and it's fully defined, we just want you to be a good fit for it, which is how I think the default way of thinking about employing people generally works. What you're saying instead is here is a role that is partly defined and there's a part of it that is in a sense, it's malleable, it's soft, like it's like clay that you can work with as both the employee potentially and as the organization, which means that there is a part of every employee's role when they're joining that is a bit squishy. And when things are squishy, they can be changed. And what that means is the process of negotiation is actually about what shape that squishy part of the role takes. And if you wanted to extend that, which I think it makes a lot of sense, the squishiness of things is how organizations can become adaptable, right? So when we talk about adaptation to change, when a situation changes and the organization is able to change itself in response, the only way that that change can happen is if the organization is not rigid. And so one way that organizations are incredibly rigid is when they've got hierarchies and teams of people who all expect and are incentivized to only do the jobs that they that are in their job description. And so one way that you can make an organization less rigid and a little bit softer and more willow-like rather than oak-like is to say the roles that every person or some people in the organization play are only partly rigid. Some part of it is not rigid. It's a bit squishy. And then the process of negotiation is figuring out by trying things out and seeing whether those work, how that squishy part evolves and how it gets shaped. And that, that's a really nice kind of segue into, into one of the, the next questions. Um, and to wrap the two things together, that is indeed that squishiness is that flexibility and that freedom to get out there and to experiment, to see how you fit in. Um, I, I loved how one of the examples you were talking about in one of the test kitchens was that each member of the team doesn't know what's happening, doesn't know what the answer is, but they know how each other member approaches a problem. It's their their solution approach. Um, and it's a terrible example, but like in a, a pit crew for Formula One, everybody knows exactly what their job is and exactly how they're going to do that one particular job. And so somebody's going to try to solve this with ice cream and somebody else is going to try to solve this by adding more turmeric. And, and people kind of know that the different approaches are there and collectively the team will come together and in the malleable bit, you figure out how do you fit in? But the the question that I'm trying to get to moving on from that is I love the malleable bit. I love the fact that I'm working in an environment where my clients change my challenges week to week, you know, podcast to podcast. We get a different book with a different author and a different take on things. Mm -hmm. Other team members to quote your own book say, yeah, I want to figure out my job. I want to get good at, enough at it that I can then just coast. And if you define it really, really well, that's great. If you make it flexible, malleable, changeable, that's more work than I want to put together. How do leaders in today's organizations 
manage those two different personalities. And by the way, I'm not intending to imply that the people who just want to do good enough and coast is wrong. I'm just saying it's different than the one who is Absolutely. always happy to be always challenged. Yeah. No, it, it's an extremely good question because this is a reality that managers and leaders face all the time, right? You've, you've got these two different kinds of people and, and people lie on a continuum, obviously. Uh, you've always got these two kinds of people in an organization of any size, even a, even a relatively small one. So I think it's an it's an extremely good question with real practical ramifications. So I think I have just I have two observations about that. One of them is, as you said, um, the people who want to figure out the job get good at it and then sort of keep keep using their ability in the same way. They're actually very good for jobs that are clearly definable and can therefore be thought of as being both clear and maybe also stable. So one way that leaders can, can accommodate both extremes of this personality is, first of all, to make sure that they are clear about what kind of work they are hiring for. So if you're hiring for something which is highly operational, where the scope and the parameters of what needs to be done are clearly definable and you know they're stable, don't try and hire someone that needs to be constantly challenged in order to be motivated in working. On the other hand, if you're trying to hire people into the R&D team, into I don't know, like the landing team, if you're opening a new office in a country that you've never worked in, which is quite unpredictable, don't try and find people who just want to figure out the job, get good enough at it, and then coast. So that's the first question uh, answered, or the first part of the question answered, I guess. The second part of my answer to that question, I guess, is one thing that leaders can do to help people who are interested in learning how to get good at something and then just being good at it, rather than in being challenged by constant change, is don't throw people into the deep end of constant challenge. Um, I think it's a lot like the analogy that I like is if you go to the gym and you're doing resistance training, you don't immediately start with something which is far beyond your capacity. Like if you're trying to like bench press something and you've never done a bench press before, you're not going to try and lift 250 pounds, I guess, uh, straight off the bat. What you do is you gradually work up. I think in a kind of a cognitive and effective sense, we've got the same problem with people learning how to deal with challenges that are continuous. If the first thing that they deal with is a challenge that is so overwhelming that it burns them out, they're not going to want to do it again. And they're not going to learn, I think, that uh, challenges can be enjoyable and they can be ways of they can be ways of triggering personal development. So I think the the practical thing I would say from management and leadership is that understand who it is that you are managing. And if they are people who are interested in stability, but they need to be exposed to constant change and challenge, don't start them out with overwhelming challenges. Start them out with small ones so that their capacity to be constantly challenged grows with practice. And I think the importance of this kind of growth in capacity is in three ways, right? So the first, the first aspect of it is the level of the challenge should be small enough to be manageable. How frequently they're challenged should be infrequent enough that they don't feel overwhelmed. And you should also, I think this goes to a question that uh, I know we're all interested in. You should also give people enough rest time in between challenges. And as they develop the capacity to deal with these challenges more, the level of the challenge you can expose them to will go up. The frequency with which you challenge them can go up. And also the rest time in between the challenges can go down. And and so I'm going to pull two things together. You just really nicely summarized the definition between 10,000 hours of practice and 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. Because mm -hmm. deliberate practice is only slightly beyond your capabilities. Yes. If you go all the way to the other end and you fail horrifically, you're never going to want to come back. For sure. But if, but if you fail just a little bit or just sometimes, because it's just slightly beyond your reach, yep. and you do that for a week, and then you you can do that. So now you move the goalpost again in that small incremental sort of way. That's deliberate practice because deliberate practice is always failing, but not failing horrifically, which Absolutely. is really, really great. Yeah. Um, the, and and the I think the, thing, the other, oh, so, sorry, go, go ahead. Go on, finish. No, I think the other thing is when we were talking previously about expertise, I think there is a kind of a meta expertise here, which is about the ability to be productively uncomfortable. Mm. And 
Great phrase. If you, if you engage in a, a practice, you know, like in the sense of a yoga practice or a daily practice of any other sort, in the organizational context of deliberately practicing how to be uncomfortable in a way that triggers learning, I think this is how you get to the point where you have the expertise of being able to be challenged constantly and learning from it. Yeah, very, very good. The The other I thing I was talking about oh, was... Sorry, yeah. Sorry, just, sorry, Marcus. I go promised on. you only one. <laughs> yeah, go um, on then. I will. I will. Um, I'm gonna th- do the acronym dance. You know, AI, ML. You know, RPA, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic process automation. In those first jobs that are incredibly operational, that are incredibly well defined, there are indeed a lot of people that believe those are ripe for automation. And yep. I, I still believe that's one of those things where, yeah, you can get good and get comfortable, but I'm sorry, you could also get automated. At least that's what oh, the, yeah. the, the media says, that's what the news says. I'm not saying that's my opinion, but I'd love to know your view on that versus the yeah. flexible, malleable bit. Yeah, um, totally. And I, I don't know, Mar- Marcus, is your question sort of in the same vein as that? I, I, can answer, I can answer that first, and then we can talk about the other thing later. If you'd like, uh, I, I would dial, dial, um, I would bring it back a bit to the gym and the practice thing. So, um, okay, <clears throat> maybe maybe then I just bring it quickly in as a comment because I think the the interesting part to see, and not only have we seen this in um, uh, when when the way we should learn, but for example, you know, the gym analogy actually goes quite well, and I. I think I'm going to have my first Joe Rogan uh, moment here where he would say, you know, oh, when you train, well, I, can't, I can't do his voice. Um, but essentially, you know, when you train, and that's what I learned, for example, because I, I trained for my first marathon this year and, 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 and ran one. Yeah. And there, the whole thing is about you don't try to go over what you should do. You can push yourself hard, but you can easily push yourself over the edge. And if you yeah. do, so burnout is one effect, but you know, especially with muscle training, mm-hmm. uh, when you when you watch and really learn about what athletes are doing, they obviously they always go into this uncomfortable part because yeah. that 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 stresses the muscle, it breaks it. But then the main thing they need to do, really take care of, is the healing process. Right, the mm-hmm. quicker they can heal, the better, and you can heal quicker. There was one guy, one YouTube video I watched where he said, you know, look, you can power yourself out on a Monday. And then you can't do anything on a Tuesday and Wednesday. And then yep. if you're lucky enough, you can do something rest of the week. But if I do half of that every day of the week, I will have done more repetitions and I'll actually uh, work with my muscles more. And I've given them more time to repair. Absolutely. And I will consistently outpace you. Yep. Right? So that's the balance you're, you're, you're saying there. And I think you know it applies to the gymnastics. As, uh, it, it, it applies to going to the gym. It applies to... Um, I'm an ex-skateboarder, you know, the whole thing about yeah. being able to fall off and bail and know when it goes wrong a thousand times is fine. If you slam yes. and you break a bone, you're out of commission, right? And that doesn't help. Exactly. So that yeah. kind of moderate approach, you can see this everywhere and it's interesting and it's nice to have all these stories to bring it in and say, well, exists here, exists here, exists here, learn from it. Because yeah. it must be true, right? So I, let's, let's, I, totally I leave it as a comment at this point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that this is why I think of it as being, you know, there are ways that you can throw yourself in the deep end unintentionally and without a plan. And then also, if you're a leader, there are also ways I think that you can, by design, create the kind of desperation that leads to learning, that leads to the unfreezing of the way teams work, that triggers people to go out and find new resources and learn how to do things. So doing it by design, which is in the sense of doing it with the intention of triggering learning is exactly, I think, Marcus, what you were talking about with designing a training regimen so that you are able to push yourself to the le- to the level that causes new development without pushing yourself so far that you basically debilitate, right? And I think that's a really important thing to say, which is discomfort and desperation are good when they are done by intent with intent. And that's, that's my position on, on that. And I think going back to this question about automation and whether jobs that are stable and well-defined are at risk of being outsourced, offshored, automated, roboticized. I mean, I don't think this is a good thing, but I also think it's inevitable because if your job can be documented fully in advance and always stays the same, never changes, uh, I think as you point out very rightly, it is 100% ripe for being sent to someone who is less capable and then eventually being replaced by a robot that is completely reliable. 
or an algorithm that's completely reliable. So I, I think the the, met, the meta point, which maybe now is a good time to make is, so I, I teach in a university now. And one of the things I find is that even the education system that we put students through is teaching them that discomfort is something to be, you know, eliminated, run away from. They're not trying to become uncomfortable with they're not trying to become uncomfortable so that they learn there. And a lot of students are in fact debilitated by challenge. And I think this may be where you're trying to go try with the question, but I think that from the individual employees perspective, as well as the organization's perspective, what you really need to do is you really need to be training people to be better at being challenged more by going through this very intentional, carefully designed regimen of progressively increasing challenge. Uh, because if not, then what you're doing is you're really building an organization that will very quickly be disintermediated first, and then after that automated next. And also building employees that will be disintermediated first and then automated next. And that's not a good thing. Not, not, not for society at large as a whole. Um, no, and not for the organization and not for the individual either. It's just bad yeah. for everyone. It's good for the, I guess, it's good for our machine overlords, but not good for anyone else. Yeah, and, our, and the way our current capitalist structure is set up, it's only good for the shareholders. But that's that's another of our favorite topics that we won't go into. Um, <laughs> I want to move a slightly different direction. Um, I enjoy the part where you're talking about effortless engagement and the ability for teams to embrace uncertainty in in a true sort of way. And at the top of the show, you were trying to help uh, people understand the difference between uncertainty and risk and how positive uncertainty, you know, could actually benefit in, especially in innovation programs. Um, I believe that that really kind of comfort with uncertainty is really only possible where there is certainty in other areas of that particular job position or role. So you need trust within the team members. They need to trust that their job is safe and secure. They need to trust in their leadership and their management. And I believe all of those things are certain and the trust is secure, then they can embrace uncertainty. Do you agree or disagree? I 100% agree with that. So I, even though I'm a big fan of being intentional about injecting uncertainty into personal life, organizational life for the benefits it, it creates in terms of learning and innovation, I'm also definitely not saying that all uncertainty all the time is always good. In fact, I think that's not true. So I agree with you that if you are going to be putting people into a situation where they need to do things that are uncertain, you also need to give them some sense of safety and security and certainty so that there is ballast, right? And I think especially interpersonal trust, not necessarily in the sense of trusting people. I mean, ideally, you trust all your team members as people. But the kind of interpersonal trust that I think makes the most sense to think about in an organizational context is trust in the competence of other team members, right? You should know that everyone else on your team is reliable in doing the work that you expect them to do on which your work depends. So if you know that, then you can go off and do whatever it is that you're doing and you don't have to worry about someone accidentally or intentionally sabotaging you by simply being incompetent. Um, the second thing you mentioned was trust in the security of the job. Um, I would actually modify that a little bit. Uh, the people who are most okay with, who prefer constantly being challenged, who are therefore the most adept at learning and are best at innovating and adapting, I'm not even sure that they need to trust that their job is secure because they're actually the people that, you know, you always know people like this who are so good at what they do and so good at learning to do new things that if they lose a job, they simply go find another one and it's probably a better job. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that you need to have like total job security to be able to embrace uncertainty as a team. What you do need to do is you, you need to have certainty in your own ability. And I think that comes from constantly testing that ability and having evidence both for yourself and for other people that that ability is legitimate. And so, you know, paper qualifications are in my opinion, anyway, they're super hollow uh, because often you meet people who look really good on paper, but they're actually not so great when you meet them and they're not very good at executing on stuff. And they're also not necessarily very creative or fun to work with. But the moment you work with someone who is 
enjoyable to work with, really good at what they do, very creative, and also operationally competent. No matter what, in the future, if you have someone, if, if you need to work with someone and you want to work, with, you want to collaborate with that person, who do you think of? You don't think of the people who are good on paper. You think of the, of the latter type of, of, of person, right? So I think that's the, that's the second thing. It's like not trusting that their job at that company is secure, but trusting in the fact that they can always find a job. And so they can play with the ones that they currently have. Um, and then the third thing you mentioned was trust in the leadership and management. I think this is incredibly important. Um, I think leaders and managers are often put in the position, whether truly or merely implicitly, of having to present the front of always knowing what's going on and always having things under control. And a lot of the time, even when things are literally spinning out of control, they have to put up this front, right? Like everything's fine. I'm in control. Things are going to be all right. And I think people who are part of organizations often realize when things are not going all right, even when leaders are presenting this face that things are going fine. And so one big part of trust and leadership management is simply leaders and managers being honest about what they have control of and what they don't have control of. And I won't name names, but we can see, especially in political leadership right now, exactly this situation happening, right? A national leader, perhaps more than one, says things like everything's under control. And the rank and file of the organization, which is to say everyone else who lives in the country, they look at what's going on and they're like, this guy has no idea. And does that create a sense of security that allows you to deal with productively the uncertainty in other parts of your life? Absolutely not. I think exactly the same thing happens in, I would say, the vast majority of organizations. Because most leaders think that they have to, to do their jobs well, present a face of complete competence, when in reality, it would be much better. And we can also name now some other leaders of some other countries that are just very transparent about the things that they have control over and the things that they don't, like the Prime Minister of New Zealand, like Angela Merkel, for instance. So I think there is something to learn about trust in leadership and management. It's not about presenting the face of complete competency when it is not true. It is about explaining very clearly and transparently what is under control and what is not so that people underneath in the organization have the ability to trust in leaders that they are transparent about that. I think that's, um, I had to follow up to something you said earlier, but I wanted to comment on that because I think that particular subject matter just came up. Was it just yesterday, Troy, we talked about this, about, you know, that it is amazing that probably since the 90s, no president or leader of a country has ever you know, publicly acknowledge that they were wrong on anything or apologized for anything. It's sort of a thing that's been taught to them to never do because it goes with, you know, uh, with with believability, not be believability, but just, you know, being a leader. And it's a really weird extremist level to which we have come today. But on the other, on the other side, I wanted to maybe pick up on a detail you mentioned earlier, which is trust with management. So we, we, we talk a lot about you know, an environment where failure is accepted and the idea that if we are, if a modern organization needs to go and experiment more, which they definitely should, I think that's a given. But in order for experimentation to really work and to do like a couple of hundred experiments, you need to be able to accept the failure as a value or a Absolutely. failure or, or, or be okay with that there is a failure uh, and then move on and go do the next thing. How do you, how do you, how how do you talk to leadership of the management to to basically challenge that you know to, to basically challenge that there is a bias essentially on on success and 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 failure and all these things and how how do you how do you, how you twist it because it's interesting again and we quite, keep quite referring to that a little bit um to, to Richard Chatterway's um podcast we had with uh, about behavioral science and talked about lots of biases that we all have but yeah. leadership rarely acknowledge that they have a bias themselves absolutely and that is a really nice thing to bring back you know so you yeah. know i think last time we talked about survivor bias and that 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 yeah. things that are known to us yeah. are more accepted to be of less risk even so it's not true so yeah. how do you how do you get that back to leadership to say you have a bias towards what you already know and the unknown 
is always yeah. perceived as a bigger risk, but you need to really start embracing this. How do you how do you go about this? For sure. I, I think it's, well, A, it's really, really hard. Um, I mean, in my consulting work, I, I also deal with this a lot. I, I'm sure the reason you're asking this question is because you run into this problem constantly, right? So I, I think maybe one way to think about it is to focus on this idea of um, success bias, which is actually just the other side of, of failure stigma. And one thing that I have found seems to help. I don't know if it does because it's all anecdotal. One thing that seems to help, which sounds really hokey, is to simply uh, fill up headspace with stories of how success uh, was two things. The first one is not as bad as people thought it would be before they failed. And second, a way to learn that led to subsequent success, right? So I think we have in culture generally today a bias towards wanting to hear stories of success because they're always great stories. Like it's it ends well, it's great. And sometimes those stories of success begin with stories of failure, but they're always anchored on the success that comes after the fact. Now, what we probably need to do, and this is now again culturally, but you can think about it in the organizational context as well, is we need to instead build stories that are anchored around failure and then on the back end of that, talk about how the failure leads to success, right? So it's just a, a change in emphasis. And very practically, I think this is what leaders need to do. They, they need to model behavior inside organizations because if leaders don't talk about how they have failed and therefore succeeded in the past, uh, they are not going to get the senior management to do it. And if the senior management's not doing it, then the junior management's not gonna do it. And if the junior management doesn't do it, then the people below them are not gonna do it either. So I think just to sort of like re-say what I just said, it's that we tend to tell stories that are anchored on success and then kind of throw in the failure as a way to explain it as, a, as an afterthought. I think instead, what people need to do is they need to build stories that are anchored on and explicitly about failure and then throw in the success as an afterthought, as a way of justifying it. Um, and that leaders need to do that first to make it okay for the rest of the organization to do it as well. And if people start to tell these stories about failure being on the path to success, it will become less bad to fail. Now, the other thing very practically that you can do is you can stop incentivizing, incentivizing success as much as we do in corporations today. Like we generally give people bonuses for success. We don't give people bonuses for trying things out. So you know maybe that's another thing that very practically can be done, but that's a massive change, right? That involves significant economic investment in, for instance, um, personnel incentive, incentive schemes. So I'm not sure how practical that is for very large companies, but certainly I think it can be done in small ones. So I've got a, a couple of really interesting follow-ups to that because there was a whole lot in there. Um, and sadly or not sadly, they're both fairly trite. Um, I forget which book it was, but Malcolm Gladwell used to talk about the fact that the one of the biggest problems we have is in the education system. Mm -hmm. In the education system, people are disincentivized from taking risks because, you know, if the A is the top score, you can only ever get an A. You can never get above an A, which means yeah. if you tried something and it didn't work and you got a B or you got a C, then yeah. you're screwed because you're never going to be able to come back. Yeah. And it actually breeds out this risk or breeds in risk aversion yeah. to people at a very, very early age. And as you were saying, kind of success within corporate or enterprise environments continues to do that. You're only rewarded if you do well, if you don't, you've screwed up. In America, if you haven't gone bankrupt twice, you're not trying hard enough. In Europe, if you go bankrupt once, they aren't going to touch you with a barge pole when it comes to a yep. VC or, or a startup. Yeah. The, the other one is this word failure. And so, you, you know, the terrible thing, the terrible joke they talk about, whatever you do, don't think about elephants Yeah, and, and how you're now stuck thinking about elephants Pink and one. the word don't or, or the negative is completely lost. Yeah. I think we should not talk about failure. I think we should talk about not succeeding. We didn't succeed. And during yeah. the process, we learned A, B, C, D, and sure. E, and we achieved goals X and Q. Yeah. And if we drop the word failure and replace it with not succeeding, to your point, we're telling stories about success 
sometimes mm. positive success, sometimes negative success, but it's always focusing on success. Yeah. I mean, I, I can definitely see why that might be one approach to take. The, I think, but I, I can, I would also say that in I, a I said way, they were both kind of trite. <laughs> no, no. Right? The thing is they, I mean, trite, whatever. It's like, that's a, that's, that's basically your subjective perception of whether or not it's trite, right? I, I don't know if it is trite. Um, one one thing that I would say in, in reaction to that is I kind of almost think, no, actually I do think, <laughs> um, I do think that we just need people to learn how to become less wimpy about failure. So sugarcoating it by calling it not success is just going to delay it. Okay. Uh, in, in the end, in the end, honestly, for most for most things, failure is not the end of the world, right? So your example about students in school getting a B or a C, is it really the end of the world? I think it's just been culturally and socially constructed to seem like the end of the world. Um, and maybe it actually isn't so bad. So I think... As, as long as universities are using GPAs to, to decide yeah. who gets in and who doesn't, that's sure. what's defined by their end of the world. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think one of the interesting things about that is... If you are the kind of person who really desperately wants the kind of job where you are being selected algorithmically based on your GPA, I think there is there is some truth to the statement that maybe you really should be trying to get A's. Whereas if you were the kind of person that was trying to, for instance, create a job for yourself and you were actually very good at, I don't know, doing internships and doing other things to sort of put yourself in situations where a job can be created around what you want you know, you can, where you can negotiate the parameters of the role. I think that if you're good at that, honestly, unless your GPA was truly abysmal, like you just got Fs in everything and you mm. didn't get a diploma at all, it probably doesn't matter so much. Like right now, I mean, we, I, I'm working on some other projects on the side. I know that I would much rather hire someone who is interesting and maybe doesn't even have like a university degree at all instead of someone that is not that interesting and has a, has perfect grades on paper. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, I, I mean, I can see both sides of the argument. Like if you want to get organizations to be better about not succeeding, maybe we should talk about not succeeding and not failure because that's a trigger word right nowadays. But I can also see how we really just need to get people to be okay with failing because it's actually just not so bad. It's not like the end of the world. I don't think it is really for most people and for most kinds of failure. And I, I appreciate all of that. I could have talked about another four or five things, but you know that that red flashing light in the corner yeah. of my eye that says we're, we're nearly out of time. I'm going to read one more quote, then I'm going to hand it over to Marcus to, to kind of wrap up. Um, I love this kind of learning around motivation. Commit to a project beyond the team's ability. Freak out individually or collectively. Work like mad. Somehow pull victory from the jaws of defeat breathe a math massive sigh of relief, and then do it all over again. And given enough time to rest between those projects, that's how you build great teams. Really, really loved talking to you. Marcus, over to you to, to wrap it up. Yes, um, I'm proud I didn't um, do the fanboy <laughs> Uh, food thing. I really, I really had to hold back on this one. I'm but just no, an average think... foodie, so I'm, I'm feeling very inferior compared to you two. <laughs> and I think what I, what I really want to say, because, you know, I worked in advertising and I think when I did my MA over at Royal College, what we were taught was a lot to talk about unique ideas or important ideas um, by being being a good storyteller, by bringing out the right metaphors to talk about something that might be a bit drier and maybe not as sexy as food often is. And uh, I think you've done an amazing job with this book. I, I absolutely love it. And there's so much in there for managers and people who work in teams or want to build teams to learn in it. So I'm I'm really happy we could have you here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you spent some time with us and for all your insights. So thank you, Warren. It was a pleasure. Yeah, a great pleasure on my part as well. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It was, a, it was really a lot of fun. <laughs> great. Thanks again. Yeah, fantastic. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-hosts Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes.
You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com. 